I started flipping shoes in high school and that was like my no way because I worked one summer job ever. So I've only ever worked technically one job and I have nothing bad to say about jobs. Like it's obviously like they're, they're so needed, right? But I just, the whole summer, two and a half months, I made like $900. You know, I think in general, entrepreneurship has gotten a little bit of like a stain with the rise of social media, just because it's like, if you go scroll Instagram reels and you look at the type of content that on, or, you know entrepreneurs put out, like probably nine out of 10 reels is some sort of lifestyle clip mashup of them on their you know fancy vacations, fancy cars, fancy watch. And it's like showing people that that's what it means to be an entrepreneur now. All right, man, Alex, thank you so much for this, man. Really looking forward to get into it. And uh, where I want to start is where do you want to become the Warren Buffett of software? Yeah, it's um, it's very interesting because I was I was raised in a pretty traditional household where it was like you buy index funds or you buy mutual funds or you buy a bunch of the S&P 500. And it's like, you know, when you're 40, 50, 60, it'll be a lot of money. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like that still works, right? Um. Mm -hmm. But it was like, and I don't even remember who said this. I think multiple people have said this. They're like, well, I only invest in things that like I understand. If I don't, if I don't understand something, I don't put my money there. And I was kind of thinking about that. And it was like, as I started to like see more success, I was like, well, if I put $500 or $1,000 a month into the S&P versus if I, you know, put that into marketing for one of my companies, putting that into marketing yields me a much greater return. And it's like, you know, software companies give me the ability to cash flow. Um, eventually, you know, they don't cash flow very well immediately from the start, right? Because you're going to put it all back into like more development, early marketing, whatever. But, you know, what I talk about the most is you're all building a sellable asset at the same time. And so for me, it's like, I would rather put the majority of my money into starting or buying or scaling my software companies right now and then as i have more exes later on and you know i have a big lump sum of money then it's like it's kind of i think hormozy said it's best he's like basically keep investing into yourself and your businesses until you like physically can't invest more into them then that's when you go put them in you know wherever you want to generate passive income or whatever yeah put into the put into the dumb boring shit when you have the money because right. like if it's a one percent yield man on on 10k it's nothing right but on a right. million two million Actually, funny, funny on that. So I was living in Singapore before I moved to Indonesia. And, uh, so, you know, you had a background of finance, I had a background of finance too. A lot of my friends would be private bankers and a lot of their clients would have generally over 500 million to a million, to, to a billion, should I say. And their biggest concern is how not to lose your money. So they're not even spending yep. it. The yield that they're getting on their, on their like, deposit account is enough for them and their children to like live the rest of their life. So that's when you get to like real fuck you money. But obviously until then you need right. to use the cash effectively, which is what you're doing, right? But I want to take a little bit of a step back as in, so you're talking about buying companies, scaling companies, you know, flipping them, all this shit, right? What got you into this thought process? Because for someone who's 22 years old, that's such a unique perspective to have. Yeah, so long story short, when I was in finance and I realized that wasn't what I wanted to do. And so I started looking for a way out and, you know, failed trying drop shipping for a long time. Um, and then after failing drop shipping, it led me to online sales, um, which clicked really quickly. Um, I had a very like natural ability to sell, um, simply because I under I was able to relate to a lot of the people that I was talking to of like, you know, they wanted to go from point A to point B and even with no formal sales training, I understood that. Um, and so I scaled that as a sales agency because I was playing tennis in college. So I didn't have much free time. So I would literally just like, we were, my clients tonight where we weren't even using Calendly. It was just like, I was in their DMs and I would schedule people for like whenever I had like 10, 15 minutes free. Cause my schedule was just like so happy. Like I would never have like a actual like 30 minute like slot open in my day. It would be like 10, 15 minutes. And I'm like, yeah, I'll call a guy I'm like, yeah, we got to run through this in like 10 minutes. Like, uh, <laughs> Like it was, it was nuts. Um, the only time that I would be able to go like over 15 minutes was literally like, I would take calls at like Friday, Saturday night at like 10 PM. Um, like it was crazy. Um, but so then as I started scaling this business model, I started talking to a lot of agency owners and, you know, higher level business owners and they're like, well, we're not going to work with a sales agency. We're not going to work with a guy 
who's then outsourcing the sales calls to another guy and splitting the commission with them, which makes, I wouldn't either now, right? Um, and so they were like, if you can find me, if you can just find me good sales reps, I'll pay you like for you know giving me that sales rep um, in-house. So I started doing that as a freelance recruiter. And then I realized all these inefficiencies with the recruiters after talking to these people, like they charge too much, they take too long, their sales reps aren't experienced. And I was scaling this model decently. And I remember like, I thought it was crazy because like someone paid me like $5,000 for one rep at, at one point. And um, which isn't crazy at all. Uh, but I thought it was crazy at the time. And um, so I was like, how do I like make this more efficient? Because I was also like, I'm still very strained on time because of my schedule. And I met or I re-talked to like this old buddy of mine. And he was like, well, you should like sassify it. And I was like, what do you mean you should sassify it? And he was like, you should turn it into a software, like make it like a hiring platform. And I was like, well, dude, I don't have like, you know, 30K to shell out to do that. Yeah. And he was like, well, you don't have to. Like you can do it on no code. He's like, go check out like Stacker, Airtable, um, and Member Stack. And so I was able to scrap together this like crappy MVP using Stacker as the front end, Airtable as the back end, um, Member Stack for like the membership and payments with Stripe integrated and Zapier that tied everything together. And launched it with a Twitter thread got a bunch of customers because it really it really resonated and had a really strong product market fit um and that was the start of getting into no code SaaS for me man what the fuck how did you how did you know like to use like Airtable and whatever because i didn't even know Airtable was used as a data told me, i'd never heard of it. i was literally like i was like dude i was the same way i was like what what is it that you told me to use and i was like writing them down <laughs> and then i went and like googled them all and it was like like stacker Airtable, member stack like that tech stack to use so easy but i remember like it was hard for me to figure out because like i'm not that techy of a person um yeah i eventually scrapped together and it's funny because i have i have like pictures of it still uh that i wish i could like flash up on the screen or like maybe we can like after this is like all chopped up and whatnot um but it is like i mean it looks horrible right like it is but what i always tell people is it served the core functionality that it was supposed to of connecting business owners to sales reps that was the core functionality, right? Like that was the value add that people were looking for. Hey, we will connect you to experienced and vetted sales reps. So it looked horrible, but it did its job. And so because it did its job, we were able to make a couple thousand dollars with that MVP and then, you know, make a better product and then make a couple more thousand dollars and make an even better one, so on and so forth. How did you reinvest that money? So like, did you, is that when you started getting developers? Yeah, so literally like that first money that we got and keep in mind, I was still, so we launched in, um, February of 2021. So I was still in college at the time. I didn't leave college until like, um, a middle of April, 2021. And then I didn't really have like many expenses then until I actually like, moved out in, um, September. And so I didn't really have to like pay myself. Like I, I had saved up some money from like doing sales myself. So I wasn't too worried about paying myself at that time. Um, so yeah, all the first money like went back into development. Like then the next the next version we built a little bit better with Webflow and Webflow CMS. And I think that cost us like $2,000. And then that one, it, it looked much better, but it still wasn't like amazing. Um, made a couple more thousand dollars. And then after that, we moved to Bubble, which is what we've stayed on since. And so that build then was like, I want to say that was like $6,000 or so. Mm -hmm. So like, as you mentioned there, but the, the cost, so conventional wisdom with SaaS for like anyone to get MVP could be like 10 to 30,000. And for... Just full disclosure, like, so I've had like backer to software. I actually have a podcast, like a media, a media company now, which has like a bunch of podcasts. That's like my, my company, mm -hmm. but I was going to build a SaaS company or I wanted to build a SaaS company, but my idea was that it was going to cost me 10 to 30 K. Right. So can you even break down that point as to like how you overcome that? Like what's your process to overcome that? Yeah. So basically you got to build your MVP as a for like, it's very important to get to market fast. Like that is the most important thing uh, because there's there's a misconception that there's a tech moat at this level. There is a tech moat if you're spending half a million, a million dollars on you know research and development. Like it's not 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 as many people have half a million to a million just be like, oh, that's a cool idea. Boom, million dollars out the wallet. Like, let's go yeah. replicate it. But people have this false sense of like, oh, if I spend you know twenty k to get my MVP built you know, fully coded, like I'm going to have this big moat. No one can copy me. Like, do you know how many 
people that are really smart that are young like if they see an idea they're like oh this is really good they can they'll throw out 20k in less than a minute they won't even think about it. like you don't have a tech boat so i think it's very important to get to market quickly um and so there's a lot of ways that you can build your mvp there's so many builders out there now and a lot of them are really good so i always talk about software software is the easiest to use by far like it is so easy to like i'm with full conviction if i told like one of my parents like hey go to this site and build this like they would figure it out in probably like a day. Like it's just so simple. It's very drag and drop. Now, with that being said, like everyone's gonna like comment on this. Like, yes, the functionality on software is limited. Like you are not going to build a crazy, crazy web application on software, but you can still, you can build CRMs, you can build portals, like you can build some cool stuff. Um, and again, you can build something that again is just an MVP until you can afford to build something better. Um, there's Glide. There is um, Flutter, Flutter Flow. So the, the two most difficult are Flutter Flow and Bubble. So mm -hmm. they're slightly easier to learn than learning how to code, but they're still difficult to learn. They still have a learning curve. Like they'll still probably take you like one to three months to learn. And mm -hmm. it'll probably take you a little over three months to be like really, really good. So we're like you can design really good, you know, all these different types of stuff. Um, but Bubble and Flutter Flow, you can build basically anything. Like because they're technically low code, so you can inject code into them. So that's why I say you can build basically anything. Um, there's a lot of builders out there. So if you wanted to build it yourself, I would recommend you starting with a softer, a glide. Um, and there's a few others out there now that are a little bit easier, um, that just aren't as popular yet. And then, or if you just want to like shell out a little bit of money, like you can get something built on bubble for like probably $5,000. Um, you could definitely find quotes for less than that, but I just, I, I avoid cheap developers like the plague because like I've been, I, I've been burned by them. Um, and so, you know, they'll normally build things in a way that are very clunky and makes it hard to build on top of later. And then you get to a point where you have to completely rebuild your product just to add one new feature because they didn't build it in the right manner. Um, mm -hmm. so I avoid cheap devs like, you know, the plague, but yeah, you can build something on yourself on soft or on glide, you know, there's a dollo, um, and there's a few others that I'm I'm blanking on, but yeah, you can absolutely build them yourself. Like you know, pull up a YouTube tutorial or like softwares got all these all these templates that like are literally like ninety. Like I just made a YouTube video on that. It's like it's ninety percent done, and then you can just customize it. Like the easiest thing now is like ninety percent done. Add one little AI element, and like boom, now like you can use that AI. <laughs> like hundred percent, man. All right, people, we're just going to take one short little break for a little update about Podcast University. So if you enjoy podcasts like this and you want to start your own podcast, head down to the links down below to Podcast University. This is a learning platform that I've built to help people like you build, launch, and scale your own podcast. I wasted many years doing this, making it all up as, a lot as I go. So I put everything together in a very seamless and, and easy to follow course for you guys to follow and just learn exactly how to do it. So if you want to bypass a lot of the mess with your podcast, Check out the links down below to Pockets University and it will show you exactly how to launch and scale your own podcast. I actually want to walk through that as well from a design perspective. So like I've like fucked around with Bubble previously and you're dead right. Like there's, there's like a learning curve that obviously you can code on top of Bubble, which is like mm -hmm. the kind of difficulty. I actually found it quite difficult, not going to lie to you. It is. But there's a few different things that I want to get into with this as well. Like because we're jumping around, right? But deliberately, when you're looking at some like no code or low code solutions, Mm -hmm. How are you learning the UX UI side of things? Because like that's fucking a huge component of what would keep people on a platform. Absolutely. Um, so again, it's like the only things that I've ever built personally is MVPs, like very, very early stage MVPs. And the truth is they're probably not, like I said, they're not going to be the prettiest. That's probably the truth of it. Um, and like I said, I'm not that technical of a guy and it's, it's not really worth my time to learn how to get really good at building these MVPs, especially at this point. Um, now, softer, like I said, I'm going to keep going back to this because the majority of people that are going to watch this are probably going to be like people that are going to want to use software because it's just so easy. You have to do it themselves, whatever. It's so easy to customize. Like you click on a, they're all like little boxes. It's very similar to like using like a web flow. They're all like these boxes. You click on one and then you can, you can add or you can edit, like you can add the padding, you know, make the, the size of it and you can, you know, uh, make the color different. You know, you can, all you have to do is click this little plus button and then you can add blocks and elements and all this different stuff. Like it's very easy to do. Um, but again, you're probably like, if, if you're worried about the UI UX being like perfect on your MVP, like that's the type of thing that sets people back because then you just say like, oh, it's not perfect yet. So then you don't launch and then you're taking too long to get 
ship it. And then someone else that just said, Hey, I'm going to make something ugly, but I'm going to ship it fast. And they're going to like, in my opinion, they're going to beat you nine times out of 10. hundred percent. That's the main principle of a lean startup as well yeah. is just get to get it fucking out and get it fucking right. moving. You know, right. that's the whole idea. I want to walk through like some of like your, your earlier pursuits. So you said there about like drop shipping and stuff. Yeah. Um, like, were you always kind of like on the more entrepreneurial side your own background? Yeah, I was. Um, I started flipping shoes in high school and that was like my, no way. Because I worked one summer job ever. So I've only ever worked technically one job. And I have nothing bad to say about jobs. Like it's obviously like they're, they're so needed. Right. Um, but I just, the whole summer I made $900, like two and a half months. I made like $900. Um, and it, it wasn't like I was working like every single day. Like it was like a very like laid back job, but I was just like, dude, like I made like no money. You know what I mean? I was like, there's gotta be a way to like make more money than this. And I, I found shoe flipping and I can't remember what pair, like what initial pair I got lucky on, but there was probably one initial flip that I made like 200 buck, bucks on. And that was a lot of money to me, of course. Cause like, that was like a fifth of what I just made all summer. Um, and so I started flipping shoes and I started getting pretty good at it actually. Um, to the point where like, I was like buddy, buddy with some of these managers at some of these stores and there were these exclusive releases and they were holding pairs for me because I'd made friends with them and like, you know, stuff like that. And so I'd be walking, um, out of these like hype releases, with like five to 10 pairs, like minimum of this hyped up shoe. And I'll be making anywhere between like 50 to like 200 bucks on average on each pair of shoes. So I started making actually pretty decent money flipping shoes. And so that kind of showed me like, why would I go work a job when I can do something like this and make way more money? And it's like, keep in mind, I only did in person. I didn't do any of like that online botting. So it was yeah. like, I was only probably like, you know, working like, I don't know, 10 days a month. Like whenever there was like a hype drop or something, maybe less <laughs> even like, and I would just get like me and a bunch of my buddies. We'd like go wait in line, you know, all this other stuff. You know, so it was kind of fun. It was like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was enjoyable. It's not like a, it's not like an actual job, man. You know what I mean? That's, that's the difference is the fact yeah. that it's like, like internet money is like basically internet money or like that type of money. It's like fun. It's like a video game. So yeah. everything is like a bonus, of course, especially when you're young, because when you're young, it's like, regardless, I'm going to be fine to some degree. It's there's less like stakes involved, you know? Yeah. So I want to get into, uh, Let's go through some of like your, your own personal objectives. So like I think it's quite funny there how you were into like flipping shoes and now you're doing it with like companies and you're buying companies and whatnot. Yeah. So like what are your own like personal desires like in terms of like what you want to build? Like you're more interested in like software. Like why do you think that is that you want to go down that path? Well, the reason I'm so interested in software now is again the exit multiples again. Uh, and also I do like it because I like seeing the product develop over time. I like seeing the the progression of making something better, of adding new features, of making the UI cleaner, like you said. Um, it's really satisfying to watch. Um, and also you're just, you know, I think in general, entrepreneurship has gotten a little bit of like a stain with the rise of social media, just because it's like, if you go scroll Instagram reels and you look at the... T- type of content that on or you know entrepreneurs put out yeah. like probably nine out of ten reels is some sort of lifestyle clip mashup of them on their you know fancy vacations fancy cars fancy watch um and it's like showing people that that's what it means to be an entrepreneur now is to like go live this crazy life and i i get it that's the reason that you want to do it but that's not what being an entrepreneur like is like in my opinion being an entrepreneur is is creating amazing solutions to problems and and that's it it's like you know you think back to like your your thomas edison's and you know all these guys that like you know invented revolutionary things and so you know i'm not doing that but it's like i like to think that i'm at least building cool solutions to problems that are actually affecting people and or businesses and i think that's cooler than just like me running a marketing agency and helping a local restaurant get more customers Hundred percent, man. I think what's cool there is like you're at such a still an early age. So like, yeah, you've done like well, you've done multiple companies during this period, but the Thomas Edison stuff is actually to come like those like huge monumental changes because you're learning every single fucking time, man. Like your product is getting better and better and better, right. and every time you come back at this, like you're getting you're you're taking that next level level up. I know you're focused on MVPs right now, but imagine like if you wanted to go fully into a business 
as right. a CEO or like even like head of product at some stage of your own business, that's mm-hmm. when you could make those huge revolutionary changes, which I completely resonate with, man. Like I think that rise of just like Lambos and fucking Rolexes. Now, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just, it's not really me. Like it's just something that I don't, yeah. I don't do it to get to that stage. Like I'm in like the podcast industry because I've been here for the last couple of years. I've really enjoyed it myself. Now I'm working with a lot of people and I'm working with big kind of companies because I'm just interested in it. And the fact that it's a big opportunity, right? There's like a big opportunity yeah. to be enterprise stuff. So obviously I would be a fool to say that I'm not doing it for that for that reason. But at the same time, I'm not doing it so that I can post it on Instagram. Right. Which is like, which I don't know, maybe that's something more geared towards your your generation because like you're five years younger than me. I'm not 27, you're 22. So maybe in that gap, that's when like, the new wave of entrepreneur is just like looking for that status. Look, I like your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think so. And again, I think it is largely due to social media. Um, and just like, and it sucks because I think everyone almost like, you have to buy the thing or spend the money on the thing to realize that you didn't actually care about it. You just thought you did. So like, mm. you have to like, you do like have to buy the car to learn you didn't care about the car. You have to buy the fancy vacation to like find out you don't, you, maybe you do or don't, to, but to find out either way, you you do actually have to do it. Because otherwise it's like, it's very easy to like say, oh, I don't care about nice cars, but maybe you actually do. Like maybe you do buy them. That is your thing. Because it is some people's things. Um, like maybe you do have to buy the watch. Be like, oh, this was a waste of, you know, a couple thousand dollars or Maybe you buy it and you're like, wow, this is actually really cool. Like, I like wearing this. I like the, you know, perceived status it gives me. So I do think that you have to do the thing to figure out if you like it or not. I'm not saying like go buy a Lambo, especially if it's like not a good financial decision to you. But I think what happens more often than not is someone will get to the point where they can either afford the car, the wash, or the vacation, and they will buy it. And then once you buy it, you'll figure out if you actually care about it or not pretty quickly, in my opinion. Um, So, yeah, man. I think what's interesting there is like entrepreneurship in general exposes your insecurities for the right or wrong thing. So like if you're insecure about your own like confidence, you'll go in to like sales calls or VC calls or or like anything to do with your actual product and you wouldn't be able to get the idea across. At the same time, if it does work, you will still have that in, that inferiority to some degree whereby you're trying to show this off to other people then. So it's kind of like, it is like, a, like as cliche as it sounds, it's like a journey, but of course it's like, you don't want to taint that reputation that you're trying to build. Like, and like for you, like your branding has been so on point over the last couple of years that we were discussing, but that's, what's kind of interesting, especially because like you have lots of young guys who actually are doing really well. Like, I don't know how many companies you've actually sold or like, you're like, you know, you're passing off in some regards, mm-hmm. but there's been a lot of times for you, you could have stopped mm-hmm. for a bit and just taken a fucking year off, chilled yeah. out in Miami, you know? But you've yeah. been you you've stuck at it because you obviously you would enjoy the process more than just fucking showing it off. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I would say um, there, there's some really interesting points to extract from that. It's like I, I did notice something. I honestly noticed this more in 2022 than in 2023. So 2022 like was like our hockey stick growth at Clubify, and um, it one thing that helped me very much so stay like level-headed and not necessarily just like go like relax because it is very easy to relax once you like you know your 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 cash flow is good like the money in your bank account is good it is very easy to relax right you're like i don't have to do this right it's very very easy i don't know if you've experienced that but i definitely did um and so now one thing that i would do to help myself is i would pay myself the same amount every single month so it didn't matter if we had a huge record month or like a low month, I would pay myself the same. So that way I would, I would stay level. Um, but now the other thing is like, you know, after I, so I sold Closeify in March of, or I made, I made the agreement in February of this year, the deal went through in March. Um, it, it was literally like within a week of the deal closing that, that, that one reel went absolutely viral on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And that just kind of like showed me my next step. Cause otherwise I probably would have like, I, like, I probably would have been like in a like a stall for a few months figuring things out, but um yeah, literally like within a week of that deal finalizing, like that real like, crazy viral. So you obviously probably heard this too about like when people sell their first company, they get like really depressed, they get like really lonely, really depressed. Now I've never fucking experienced that obviously, but can you talk anything about that in terms of like what you think that would be? 
like why would people feel like that that after getting that big lump sum they then feel that area of like to some regards like depression or just a low feeling of uh, emotion all right guys one short little update for voix i want to give a short little overview about my own company my media company called voix so if you are a company or you are an enterprise looking to grow your brand and looking to grow your podcast feel free to reach out to work with us at Voix. What we do is a fully fledged end-to-end -end management of your podcast. We take care of the strategy, the consulting, we take care of the growth, the management, we take care of all the editing, all the boring stuff so you can focus on creating good podcasts and create and growing your brand. If you wanna grow your podcast and get to new users, if you wanna grow your business, generate more revenue and all that good stuff, check out the links down below to Voix. You can follow through to schedule a call with our team or else you can fill out the application form to see if you qualify to work with us. Thank you. Whenever you start a company, you're like thinking about the exit. And you're like, the day I exit, it's going to be the best day of my life. You have this like conception, like it's going to be the best day. It's going to be the best day. It's going to be the best day. But it's like you fell in love with the journey of like building that company over however many years you were building. So I built Closeify for two years. And it was like, you know, the company that like allowed me to drop out of school, allowed me to move me and my friend to Miami, like allowed us to like do all these things. And then, um, you know, you sell it and you're like, well, that like it was cool, but like, you know, you were enjoying, like, you actually learned to, like, enjoy the journey, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, me personally, like, that's why I imagine that people were would get depressed. I personally, like, didn't. It was, for me, it was a, it was a really good decision. Um, and I, I sold the majority of it, too. So I am still an owner in it, uh, which was really important to me. That's why I didn't sell it at private equity. Um, is because I did care about be, uh, staying a minority in the company. But for me, it was a really good decision. And that was validated to me when I blew up on social media the week after. Of course, man, of course, because you have to document that story. I think it's a super unique because like you're a young dude who's able to do that. Going through that Closeify, so the the platform looks fucking crazy smooth, man. So did you have like involvement in how it's developed now? Because like it literally looks like a $50 million company. If I was looking on, on the on the website. Yeah, so um, I haven't um, made too many um, like critiques on the product. It was all Luke. Luke did a really good job with it um, since he acquired it. Um, and I do talk to Luke frequently, but you know, he has a ton of sales reps as students. And so they're all closing for businesses. So they have really, his sales reps have a lot of, he has a really good, lot of insights from his sales reps of what would make it a smoother process for getting hired too. So he kind of gets to see both sides of the coin. Um, and so it is, it is so smooth now. Like it is so easy to hire. It's like, I hire my sales reps through there. Right. Um, uh, like it is, it is so smooth now. Uh, and now we're finally to a point where we can turn the marketing back on. But yeah, he did a really good job on the product. Yeah, man, you really, really, really smashed it. So let's go through some of like the understandings there. So you built the MVP and as it, as it went on, it scaled up. I want to uh, ask about the cost structure on that. So when you're building on um, the soft.io, how much roughly does someone need? So let's say someone's listening to this, they want to get into the software space. What's the kind of cost structure you're looking at there in terms of how you how you build that business? Next to nothing, because soft drives, one, they have a free plan, but obviously it doesn't get you a ton. Then I think it goes up to, I don't know if it's like $30 a month or something, then they have like maybe a 60. Um, and then, you know, air tables, however much a month, a couple, you know, 20, 30 bucks, maybe. Zap, you know, you factor in Zap, yours like 29 a month. Um, like realistically, wild. <laughs> if, you wanted to build, <laughs> if you wanted to build an MVP on software, like could you probably get away with like using less than 200 bucks, like, absolutely now should you and what i normally tell people is like should you start a software company is like one you should have some form of cash flow if you're going to start one because you should not start a software company for the pure reason of cash flow because it's going to take longer to cash flow like if you're charging 50 dollars a month like it's going to take you longer to get to ten thousand dollars a month most likely than if you start an agency where you're charging three to five thousand dollars a month right like just so it's like, if the thing that you need, right, is cash flow, like you need to pay rent, like you need to put food on the table, like you shouldn't start a software company and be like, oh, this is going to be what's paying my rent, putting food on the table, whatever, whatever, whatever. You should either get a job or like start a cash flow business or, you know, sales, whatever. Um, but if you have cash flow taken care of, like you're not worried about rent, you're not worried about putting food on the table and you're like, you know, like I would want to build something over a long period of time that eventually will cash flow and eventually will be a sellable asset for me. Then yeah, you should absolutely start a software company and you can definitely start a software for a couple hundred bucks and you can let it scale as, as you know, you're able to, as it makes more money. That's, that's great advice, man, because 
So people will jump in the deep end, burn all their money in the beginning without any seeing that reward. And like the software game is that long tail re re uh, reward system. It's going to come back after a while, but of course you need to find that product market fit. So these terms, like for us, obviously, like I have an understanding of what you're saying, but to walk it through for people who are getting into this space mm -hmm. is like, how do you identify product market fit if you're outside the industry? So I'll give you an analogy. I've been in the podcast industry for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. I can see like what works, what doesn't really yep. work. And I'm like, oh, this is a good idea. That's a good idea. There's a competitor over here. But for some people, because I get comments, but it's often in terms of like starting businesses, it's like, if you're not in the industry, how do you find that product market fit? So you have to get into one, right? Yeah. Like, it, would, it wouldn't be wise for me to go, oh, I'm going to make a software in the podcasting space if I'm not in it. Like, yeah. if I want, if I decide, hey, I if I said, I recognize the podcast space is growing rapidly, I want to build a software in the space, what I would do is I would start reaching out to tons of people in the podcast space. And I would understand, like, the A to Z, like, process of how it goes. How do you find your guests? Like, how do you, you know, script your podcast if you do? Like, how do you upload them? How do you get clips? Like, all these different things. Um, and so I would be figuring out, like, okay, what are all of these different things that they have to do in order to run a successful podcast? And I would you know, talk to as many people as I can and be jotting notes. Eventually, there's going to be a recurring theme. If you do enough research, there's going to be a recurring theme of one particular part of the process that is either painful or it's inefficient or, you know, it just could be, it could be better. It could be faster, maybe. Um, like, I'd imagine there's probably a way to do, like, like I would imagine most people, and this is a complete guess, because I'm not in it, but I would imagine a very tedious part of it, at least, could be for, like, middle-sized podcasts. If you're, if you're a big podcast, everyone wants to go on it, right? Like, if you're a huge podcast, everyone wants to go on it. But if you're somewhere in the middle, I imagine it's got to be a little bit difficult or tedious to do a bunch of outreach to people that are like interesting enough for you to want to bring on, but they're not like so small to where they can't really advance your podcast. And so I would imagine that would be a tricky thing to deal with. And maybe there's a solution there that you can help. But going back to your question is you have to get into some sort of niche. Like whatever you decide the niche that you want to build, and you have to do exactly what I just said. You have to go talk to people. You have to go write stuff down. Like you have to go search the, like find companies in that niche and search the reviews of them and see what people don't like. You know, that's something that I talk about a lot. You can go to a, if you just want to like get inspiration, you can go to acquire.com and you can look at all the different software companies on there. Like look at, look at what piques your interests, you know? Um, and then, you know, find on the piece your interest and then begin the research process of, you know, studying that niche and writing down problems. Um, but you can't just be like, oh, like I'm not like, maybe you work a job or whatever, or you can't just be like, oh, I'm going to build a software in this niche. And the worst thing you could use without knowing it's going to work. Like I always tell people you should not build anything that you don't know is going to work mm -hmm. how do you build up that initial confidence or idea in advance because i've had um, a few guys on my show who were like like vc back individuals and whatnot and they had a very interesting point how um you know when things kind of got kind of shitty with the markets towards the end of 2022 a lot of vcs were not looking at free users on a platform so let's say if we built um like your platform right and everyone has free access they were not counting those as any sort of like success. So yeah, people say, yeah, I'll use your platform for sure or whatever. And then the second you hit them with the 29 to 9 or 49 yep. to 9, they pull out. So like, how do you build up that confidence to be like, all right, I'm going to go fucking balls to the wall with this now because I have had all these yeses. And how do I get that uh, that, that confidence? Yeah, so first off, it's it's kind of funny that you say that like VCs don't count like free users. Like, why would they? They're not paying you. Like, yeah. I, I'm personally, I, I'm pretty against like free plans i'm pretty against even free trials i hate free trials and i think the dumbest thing ever is when people do free trials and don't even make the credit card required i think that's ridiculous like they have no intent whatsoever um and um so when i say like i'm not going to launch anything that i don't know will work basically what i do is one i talk to i do my market research i talk to everyone i'm like you know, it's like how how painful of a problem is this for you like, is this just something that would be like nice to have or is this something that like you need, right? Like how painful is it? And two is like, how much would you pay? And then once I like say I got a bunch of yeses, a lot of people are like, hey, this is a good idea. You should build it, whatever. Then I'll build a wait list, right? So I'll build an early bird wait list. I'll build a landing page and it'll say, I'll basically call out my deal client profile. I'll say the benefits of the software that I'm going to build. 
And then I'll say the benefits of joining the early bird waitlist, like a, you know, a big discount on the launch plus like some added, you know, free PDFs, whatever. And, um, you know, I'll start doing outreach to get people on the waitlist through my audience on Facebook groups, LinkedIn, right? All these different things. And so I did this for my company, Trackify, back in 2022. Um, so Trackify was a software to like better, like track your sales team's performance, gamified it a little bit. It was like very like, um, uh, I went hand in hand with Closeify. And so I built a wait list over the course of like 30 days, got like 200 people on it, you know, launched by sending an email to the list. And like that first day we launched like $540 in monthly recurring revenue. So that's what I mean when I say, I don't launch anything that I don't know is going to work. I did the research, then I built a wait list so that I have people to launch to from day one. So sure, because so much people are going to do the, the inverse. The The wait list part of it is something that I think is very interesting because you have a nice marriage of the tech side and the, well, the understanding of the product side and the marketing side. Because I think they're, they're obviously two different elements, right? And you need to combine them. When do you start incorporating the marketing side of this into your idea pre-launch? So it's like, you want to get people on your wait list. And I understand like, it's not got to be as easy for a lot of people to get 200 people on a wait list as it was for me because I had some audience built up and whatnot. So I would say a good target is get like 50 people on your wait list through like outbound, like Facebook groups, yeah. LinkedIn yeah. outbound, like Instagram DMs, all these different things. And then... I didn't market it heavily after I launched it because I got those users. And as soon as I launch, you don't, you don't want to like this new software company that I'm getting ready to launch. I'm, I have to be very careful. I can't just put the link up on my story and say, yo, it's live because we would get way too many users on the first day. I want to get, I'm going to have to say like, yo, I'm going to let five to 10 people in the beta test this because once you launch, you want to interview every single user. Like you want to get on a zoom with them, like myself and my, and my head dev. What's breaking? What do you like? What don't you like? What would you like to see? Like we have to get this feedback and then we have to iterate it before we can like really, you know, push on the gas for marketing. Because the worst thing that we can do is I build a full marketing campaign now on my audience. I launched this thing and it's buggy and it's breaking and all these different things. And now all of a sudden it's like, all right, I just let thousands of people onto a software that's super mediocre. And then it, what's funny there is a lot of people would say, oh, well, you, it's easy for you. You have the audience, but it's actually right. the opposite. You have the audience and you have to, you have to hold it off to some degree because you have to be yeah. more cautious of what, of what it is. You know, when people going from zero. It's actually to some degree, it's actually a benefit because it can bring in a few users, get them super engaged and he, and actually feed feedback in that feedback, which most people don't really do. You know, mm -hmm. I want to ask you then about actually scaling. So you move from MVP onto moving on. When do you get to the point whereby you start hiring people and start really like improving operations and all those different elements? Once cash flow permits, really, um, like it's it's pretty simple. Like once cash flow permits, like at closes by one of the first um, hires we made was a cold email agency. So this was probably when we were at like fifteen thousand a month ish, like ten to fifteen a month. Uh, we hired a cold email agency. And they were able to book us enough meetings to where we were able to get to like 40, 50 a month. And then it was like, okay, now we can go hire, you know, a, a bigger, a bigger sales team and pay for their tech stack. And now we can hire, um, a, a VA that was helping out with like a bunch of, you know, various things and we can hire, you know, a head of recruitment. Um, so it's really just like when cash flow permits. That's interesting, man. So how many people did you have in Closeify before you sold it? At one point, I want to say we were up to like 12, you know, like contractors. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's like a solid number. I thought what you were describing was actually much more you would have. No, we, we ran very lean. Um, and I think it's it's very important to do that way. Uh, but yeah, I think at one yeah. point we were up to like 12 contractors. When do you get to the point where you, you should sell it? Like what's that indicator? It's honestly, I don't know that I know the right answer fully. Um, yet because I'm still very early in my in my career but there is some things that I, I learned is like you obviously want to sell when you're still growing right like you don't want to sell once you've plateaued um, you'll get a lower you'll get a lower multiple then you want to sell where you're still growing um, you, you don't want to sell until like a new owner could come in very very easily right like if you're still involved in a lot of different areas like if you're not just like a true CEO like the business like I, I could have taken like a month off closeify like and 
like majority of 2022, I could have taken a month off to fire, like nothing would have changed because like everything was just like set in place. Um, so you want it to be very, very automated when you sell. Um, and also a lot of it is like you as the founder, like, are you like, are, are you like ready for your next thing? Like, are you burned out? Like me personally, I was not enjoying running Clothesify as much as when I initially was. And I was kind of ready for like a new challenge. Um, mm. And so I kind of had like gut feeling that it was time. Right. And it's like your gut feeling is basically always right. So I, I sold it. And then, like I said, next week I blew up on social media. So I think it's a lot of a gut feeling too. Yeah, man, that's super interesting because at that point you need to remove yourself, which is kind of where you got to that point. But the question I freed out is like, how do you do these valuations? Because I know they're hinged on so many different variables. Yeah. There's so it, much. It's, it's very tricky because like I said, also just like the, the state of the market is like a big player, right? Like in 2021, the multiples were significantly different than they are now, right? Because um, it was like the peak of the the bull market or whatever. So the state of the economy plays a factor. But the other biggest things that I saw is, you know, they care a lot about your churn. Your churn is super important. That makes sense, right? Like, and for anyone that has no churn, it's like someone canceling their subscription to your software. So they care a lot about that. They care about your average customer lifetime value. And they care a lot about how many users you have, which kind of goes hand in hand with churn. Because let's say, let's say you have a software that has 200 users, but they all pay 500 bucks a month. Like, yeah, that's doing decent revenue. But, you know, if you lose, you know, if you lose 20 customers, that's a big, that's a big impact. That's a lot of churn. Whereas if you had 10,000 users and you lose 20, you don't care because that's a tiny percentage. So they want you to have a lot of users as well. Mm. Where did you look for buyers? Did you use acquire.com? I used to acquire, um, and then we, um, we talked to like a few business brokers. Um, but then ultimately like I was just going through my own personal network as well. And that was what really? I was doing. Yeah. How does that process work? So like, let's say someone wants to come to buy and they put like a letter of intent. How does that, uh, how does that process work? Yeah. So they basically send a letter of intent and then, you know, you go into due diligence and then, you know, now the nice part about selling to like someone I know was like. It wasn't like all these private equity firms, like they wanted to do crazy due diligence and they had all these like little sub terms within the due diligence. Um, and so like I said, private equity was probably going to take me like, I don't even know, like three to six months to get a deal to close. Um, and so that was just like really unappealing to me. Um, mm -hmm. But it's definitely the best thing that I did do is my business part was like, yo, make sure you consult a lawyer. Um if he hadn't told me to do that, I probably would have accepted like the very first offer we ever got. Cause like, just like 21 year old kid, like accepted to that <laughs> big check. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I probably would have been like, where's the dotted line and sign. Um, <laughs> like, well, luckily he was like, dude, like here's my lawyer, like call him, like hire him. And so <laughs> luckily, luckily I did. And he definitely saved me from like a lot of like headaches and Man, I said that's hilarious. I say it was hilarious when the lawyer got a phone call and he realized it was a twenty-one-year-old ringing him, telling him he's selling a company for like six yeah. figures, and he's like fifty years old. He's like, "What the fuck is going on?" <laughs> yes, no, nah, he's he's uh yeah, my lawyer. He's like 30, 38. He's a really cool guy, and he like he's 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 amazing. He's so good. Man, that's insane. So, like, true that private equity route is actually crazy because like I've seen some of the payouts to be over like six years. And they're like based exactly. on the company, a lot of based on the company's performance, a lot of earnouts, um, and they oftentimes like you know they they make the earnout targets kind of like I don't know if you want to call it unrealistic or just like ambitious, um, yeah. I mean the private equity world is like there are a lot of sharks, you know what I mean? And like they have to be, mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, there's there's a lot of interesting you know. And then they talk about like seller financing, like there's. Like I said, the whole exit process was like a big, big learning curve because again, I didn't know much about it. Um, and so it was, it was honestly really interesting to see though, how private equity firms, because that's what I ultimately want to end up getting into, right? Is I want to get into private equity eventually. So it was really interesting to see how they operate, how they think, how they structure their deals. Uh, so it was just like an interesting thing for me to see. Mm. So what would be your idea there in private equity? What would be your goal? Kind of the same thing that I'm doing now, just on a much bigger scale. Uh, investing in and growing and scaling software companies um, mm -hmm. and having, you know, a full team in place. To, and that's kind of the direction that we're moving towards. Um, it's kind of like having like this, like full, almost like just like a complete like incubator of like we buy, buy the company and then we already have the whole team required to scale it. 
Mm. So basically you're reusing the engineers and they're able to just basically work on multiple different companies. Right. Right. Mm. Man, that's insane. So I want to, I want to ask you as well about your personal branding. So like the way you went about it, we chatted about it a little bit beforehand, but like, how did you pop off on, on Instagram? Like what was the idea there in total or whether it's on, on Twitter as well? What was your kind of philosophy on it and how have you grown it since? Yeah. So again, to start off, it was a bit of an accident. I got lunch with this kid that moved to Miami, 19, shout out Presley. And um, he asked me to do a podcast. I was down and he was like, while you're here, do you want three free clips? And I was like, yep, let's, like, let's do it. And sure enough, one of those three free clips went super viral. It added like 20,000 followers. And all these people are like reaching out to me. And they're like, I've never seen someone gain so many followers from one video like convert so many followers from that many views. They're like, we've never seen that. And so at first I was just like, oh, like, you know, maybe like I was, I was lucky. Um, and all of a sudden another video pops then like a few weeks later. And it also adds like 20,000 followers. And then, you know, more videos pop and they're all just adding. To, like I, I gained 115,000 followers in 90 days. Um, and so at one point and like i'm not like when, when i record with them we don't we don't script anything now we don't plan any in advance i get to the location that they tell me i sit down i think of an idea and i just talk like i'll, I'll script the hook that's it i'll script the hook and then just free flowing. i just talk and so i had to think about it I, because people were like spamming me like they're like dude how are you growing and i was trying to think of like because these are people that i actually wanted to help and like tell them how i'm doing it so i'm like mm -hmm. all right how am I doing this? And after I like really studied them, I basically realized is one, it's like none of us are Tate in the sense of like none of us are bringing an audience to a new platform. Like, you know, he's bringing people to Rumble. But if we're posting on Instagram, if we're posting on TikTok, whatever, everyone that's going to be on Instagram is already on Instagram. You know what I mean? There's no one new coming to Instagram really. And so what that means is the audience that you want right now is someone else's audience right now. So it's going to sound bad. You have to steal someone's audience, right? Like you have to, and it doesn't mean they can't follow both of you, but like you have to put yourself in front of someone else's audience and you have to convert a belief that they have from following that other person and convert it to your belief. And if you can do that successfully, you gain a lot of followers. And so I have, the other thing is I have two segments. So I have people that are interested in on, like I'm getting to create my own, my own market. So I have people that are interested in making money online, but they've never heard of no code SaaS. Like they don't even know what it is, which most don't. And so I'm getting to create that awareness inside of that existing market. And then the people that do know what it is already, I'm getting to change their belief that, Hey, you shouldn't do agency, e-com, whatever you should do software. Um, and so if I'm able to successfully convert their belief of, Oh, I, sh I shouldn't do an agency because I'm not building much equity to, I should start a software company. Then they're going to follow me and I'm going to become the go-to guy for no code software. Um, and so the really big thing is like one of the first words that comes out of your mouth has to be something recognizable by the masses. Like if I said no code software, like immediately, like now it will do fine because I already have an audience. But if I was starting again, I said no code software, yada, 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 yada. Yeah, yeah. Like it's not going to go viral because no one knows, like no code software is not, it's not broad enough yet. So mm -hmm. the framework that I think I follow in my head is I say something that everyone will recognize. And then I say something slightly like not, not controversial and like a, douchey way but in a way that like challenges a belief they previously had and then i explain my reasoning and then i back it up with proof um mm. and that's kind of how i go about doing it like if you look at like my most viral videos like iman godzi shut down his agency to go all in on SaaS. iman godzi everyone knows who he is now he, he blew up everyone knows who he is and so even though this isn't even really controversial but it was to a lot of people because a lot of people just don't follow him that closely a lot of people still don't know that he shut down his agency and then even if they don't know that, they don't know that he did it to go all in on his software. And so that's like a factual statement that I'm saying. I'm like, he shut down his agency to go in software. Like, it's a fact. And people wanted people wanted to flock and either tell me I'm wrong or they wanted to be like, oh, interesting, he's right. 
And so then after that, I explained like, why are they doing this? It's because software has equity value. That is why they're doing this. It's the next play for them to get to, get to nine figures. And so once I explained that, a lot of people are like, and keep in mind, they all look up to Iman. They all look up to Jordan. They're like, this guy has a point. Like these guys that I look up to, they're actually not doing the business model that they're telling me to do anymore. They've, mm-hmm. they've gone, they've, they've ascended in software. And so they're like, this guy's making a good point. I changed the belief that they had had because they're like, you know, Iman's always, always pushing agency, agency, agency. And this isn't a diss of Iman either because like agency is the best model for some people to start, right? Um, kind of like what I said earlier, if you need cash flow, you probably should start an agency. Um, but it went super viral because it was very broad at the top. And then I explained my reasoning and everyone that stayed till the end, they're like, this guy made a good point. I want to see what else this guy has to say. So instead of continuing to swipe like they would, if I just posted a bunch of lifestyle clips, they actually mm. like call my name and they hit follow and they look at what else I have to say. Fuck man. That's so intelligent. So, so intelligent. And I could even, you could even think back of other examples of people who've done that really well. Um, JK Molina is a guy that's done it very well. Mm-hmm. Is that he's taken like, you know, growth of big followers and turn them into monetization like machines, but he's done it in that way whereby he's breaking down the concepts, a belief, and then converting that belief and showing the social proof because he's and like so 21 years old. You know what? Like, like what JK does really well is he says, you know, he, he says like St. Cash, right? And he also will say, like, you don't need a lot of followers to make a lot of money on social media. And so he has to change that belief. And if you ever like, if you think about any sort of, and this is like, it all comes back to like copywriting and just like human psychology. If you think about when you're writing a VSL, like a video sales letter, or if you're literally writing a written sales letter, or if you're making an Instagram video like I am, or if you're writing an email to your list, in order to get any, basically, um, if you're, if you want anyone to make a desired action. You want them to have a conversion event, whether it's to subscribe to your email list, whether it's to buy your your product, your software, whether it's to follow you. There's normally one core belief you have to change. So all of your messaging has to be around changing that core belief. Like when you think back to going, like you write a 30 minute VSL, right? That 30 minute VSL, you are trying to change like one core belief that if you can make that, if you can make them believe that one thing, like what is the one thing that would make people buy from you? And that's your VSL. That's what it's about. Like, you know what I mean? Um, And so that's like, this isn't just like how to grow on Instagram. This is like all of your, this is like all of your marketing material. Like it all needs to be like a conglomerated, like change one core belief that makes people, uh, you know, convert on the desired action for whatever medium uh, you're finding them through. Man, that's so intelligent. I love that because these principles are just, they're across everything, right? They're cross-serving from this conversation today where you're going through your podcast to anything you do online to anything you can write in your own company, right? Because I, I'll tell you a funny story on this. So my, as I said, my business is in the podcast space, but it was always super, super, super niched into podcasting whereby I didn't speak about content. So I'm gone from content to podcasting. So whenever I, I spoke about it, I wrote about it. Yeah, I would get engagement from like podcast nerds, but not from like, people at a higher level who are like into marketing, into copy, into sales. I actually took a step out of it recently, whereby I was speaking more on the uh, content and sales side. So like revenue generating content. Yep. But then I just swap into to use long form. That's just how I do it, right? It's just my mechanism for doing it. Yep. You can use a different format, but the word is interchangeable. You could use long for short, for written. It's irrelevant, right? And that content is on way better because it's the people that are coming from the peripherals. And they're like, oh, maybe I want to get involved in the podcast space. Maybe I should do it for my company. Maybe maybe there's more opportunity here. So I've seen that inversely affected, but it's just been kind of basically following people like yourself, man. Because I look at that content and I think, your content, and I'm like, no code. How the fuck does that blow up on a platform like Instagram, which is yep. ass and abs? Yep. So there's, there has to be that common tread, which is, which is what you're cracking. And again, it's like a- anything can become mainstream, but it's the other biggest mistake that people make when they, when they create content is they're and this is normally from a lack of actually understanding what they're talking about is they're not able to dumb down what they're talking about to a way it can be receptive of the masses. If I went and made a video right now of like, 
here's how to build. And again, it's a little bit different now because like I've already built up the audience and I've already educated them some. So it's a little bit different now, but again, start from scratch. Here's how to build your MVP to take your SaaS from zero to 100 customers. On Twitter, that's a fine hook because Twitter is like a much more sophisticated audience. I say that on Instagram and everyone's going to be like, what's an MVP? What's SaaS? You know what I mean? Like yeah. it wouldn't hit because they don't know. You have to you have to reach your audience on the level of awareness that they're at. So like when you're going, I, I call it, so every social media is a funnel, right? You have top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel. When you're making top of funnel content, the funnel that needs to go viral, the funnel that, or the, the content that's going to grow your brand, you have to meet your audience at the level of awareness they're at. So at the top of the funnel, they have very, they have no awareness of who you are or you know what no code software is or whatever you're talking about. So you have to meet them on that level of awareness. So I have to like first like again think back to my most viral video. I, I you know I say Iman Gazi, you know, shut down his agents, go all on SaaS. If you go and look at that video, there's probably ten thousand people that commented what SaaS. <laughs> like they didn't know they don't know what SaaS is. And so I have to educate them. I have to meet them on that level of awareness of, okay, I need to introduce them to the business model first. What is it? What are the benefits of it? Why you should get into it? Then I can move into middle of funnel content. How do you build your MVP? Because now they're aware of it. How do you price it? How do you launch? How do you get customers? And the bottom of funnel is like, hey, I put up a story post of like, hey, do you want my team to build yours? You know what I mean? Like you have to look at everything as a funnel because everything is a funnel. I love the learning lessons of this man because when you look back in this stuff, yeah, like for me, the penny kind of drops to that now because I've discovered this in over the last six months myself to some degree, but I've been thinking back to some of my earlier stuff when I was like writing like the most nerdy shit ever to do with like building like podcasts and enterprise podcasts. And to a degree, like a CEO of a $50 million company doesn't give a fuck about that. He just wants to know, does this solve my problem of me not looking like an idiot on a camera once a week? Yep. And then he's working his way through it. So like that's level one to your point. Level two then is, all right, this guy's not an idiot. And level three then is, you know, get on the call, pay for the fucking retainer basically. And it's not, it's not easy because like you, like I believe to go viral on social, like you have to be, one, you have to be a good speaker. Like yep. I have friends that just, they're not that great on camera. And then what's really interesting is a guy reached out to me through my Instagram and he was like, hey, dude, I would love to connect. Like, I sold my software company for $110 million. And um, he was like, I'm not able to get more than 500 views on a video. And so it's like, here's this guy that, you know, he he sold this crazy, crazy company. And, you know, he's a very knowledgeable, very smart dude. I think he, um, I think he was like a Stanford grad or something. Like, very, very wicked smart dude. And here he is, not able to get any views because, you know, he was like an operator. He was like a, you know, like a doer, like, you know, they, they raised money. He was like able to hire and, you know, do all these things that like led him to having extreme success. But he doesn't understand not everyone's a Stanford grad, $110 million exit. <laughs> so you can't, you can't pretend you're speaking to a bunch of other Stanford, Harvard, Harvard grads and think it's going to go viral. You're, everything's going right over their head, bro. Um, and so I was like, listen, and this is very hard to do, especially for someone of that caliber. That's so, so smart. It's not easy for them to speak on such a, like, um, like dumb down level truly. But it's like, I think, I think Hormozy talks about it all the time too. It's like, how can you dumb down what you have to say to literally a fifth grade level? And that's like another one of my videos that does really well. I'm like, if you've ever built a website, you can build a software company. Like that's my hook. And then I'm like, you can build drag and drop with software just like you can uh, if you've ever used Wix or Webflow or Square. And when I'm saying these things, when I'm saying Wix, when I'm saying Square, when I'm saying Webflow, remember, every time I say something that people recognize, that's tapping into a demographic. I'm tapping into the demographic of people that are familiar with Webflow, that are familiar with Wix. And so maybe maybe I hit the market of, maybe I, I reach a bunch of web developers. And then they're like, huh, I could start my own software company. You know what I mean? And so it's like, you're tapping into all these different demographics and you're changing their belief. But in order to reach these different demographics, you've got to be able to dumb it down. And that's why like some of the guys on Twitter just fucking kill it. Like, that's the reason why. And I was never really like big on Twitter. Uh, I never really used it until like, man, just barely using it now. My main channel is like YouTube. 
and that's mm-hmm. kind of it youtube and the, and the podcast itself because this takes so much time does that make sense yeah. i don't really put yeah. that much time into elsewhere but like that's why like the guys on linkedin can't write good content and that's where the guys on twitter who come across just steal all the business because they understand that even though the guys on linkedin are 10 times smarter right. phds all this stuff but like it just gets lost in the body of text like a combination of how it's written how it's put together and a good example of that i know you mentioned hermosi on that it was the fact that his business was gym launch or relaunch or at yeah. gym turnarounds. Those principles are what's applicable to software companies, agencies, brick and mortar businesses. And sure, he's basing all those principles off launching a fucking gym, bear in mind, which 99% of the people won't even pay for their membership in the world. Does that make sense? So it's funny how he's able to do that. And because I actually initially, when I first came across his stuff, like, I don't know, like a year and a half, two years ago, and he was really blowing up. I remember when I heard that he did gym stuff, I was like, ah, I'll stay out of it. I was like, I spent way too much time in the gym anyway. I was like, I don't need to like learn about how he did the gym stuff. And then he yeah. was talking about like offers and like premium offering. And I was like, wait, what the fuck? This is like super applicable to me and obviously everybody else as well. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, again, Hormozy, he did such a great job of reaching masses by doing basically exactly what i just said and now that he's got a little bit more of an audience now you'll see him going to some very complex high level business because that's middle to bottom of funnel for him or bottom of funnels then he invests in that company right 100 percent. and so he, he's, and- he's, he's done it so like another big thing is like you know i, I i'm big on studying people so like try i'm studying how hormozy does his content you know what i mean like i'm studying hormozy i'm studying Emon, like i'm studying all these guys and seeing how they do it because i, I think you're a fool not to like, these guys are like their their marketing campaigns of themselves is like a masterclass in marketing itself. You know what I mean? Like you can learn hundred hundred percent. So man, oh my god, there's so much similarities in that, right? Because I'm a big believer in that too. So like I don't so because I podcast a lot, I try to narrow my focus to what I do because I can't be just like on Instagram just flick, flicking through TikToks, right? Mm-hmm. So I have to keep it very concentrated. But then the influences that I actually follow, like the mentors that I follow, I have to be very selective in what I do because I can't necessarily be jumping across different stuff because I don't have the bandwidth, right? Mental bandwidth. Yeah. So the, the main idea is like to pick like one, which is like Hormozy or like Iman, and then like follow that principle. Now, yeah. Iman has a different approach though. He doesn't necessarily use his Instagram right. as a, like, you know, the equivalent of what Alex Hormozy does, for, right. for instance. So it's kind of like, there's different ways to approach these things, of course, but you got to find what, what works. And obviously the Hermosia Polo approach worked really well for you. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Which is very, it's because you know, it's because I'm trying to do something similar to Hormozy. I'm trying to invest in companies. Iman's approach is YouTube is where he gets to dump value to his, to his audience. Right. Um, and his Instagram is where he gets to sell a little bit of the lifestyle. Right. So, He's so big that now everyone knows who he is. So if they want the value from him, they're going to go to his YouTube. But then his Instagram, he kind of gets to show a little bit of that lifestyle that, you know, gets people excited. Mm -hmm. And like the funny thing is when you crack distribution to some degree, you can sell fucking anything, right? You know, of course, you can, you can pretty much target anything, but that's like a big area that we kind of discuss as well. Like with a lot of our clients is the fact that if you have distribution, you have a long form episode, which is what Iman does, then you can bring them into newsletters you can bring them into multiple different stuff and then follow them down into his software company now which is yep. where he, he makes all of his cash you know so different ways to crack it but i think you're way better off following someone which i use on versus just like pissing in the wind and just spitting out anything and hoping hoping it sticks yep 100 percent. man i, I want to say a massive thank you man i fucking love their session i'd love to do it in person i'd love to do another session in person um if i come to the states or you do a bit of travel um I have a studio that's based in Bali as well, which is like really nice for like, you know, yeah. longer, longer sessions. Uh, but man, I want to say a massive thank you and anything I can do for you in the future, always feel free to reach out, man. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. This was really fun. I enjoyed it.